Hi, my name is Jessa, and please join me as we look together top 10 disgusting facts about ancient Hittites not told in textbooks. Number 10, marriage and gender roles. The Hittite society adhered to traditional gender roles, which may be considered restrictive or inequitable by modern standards. Women had limited rights and were often subjected to authority of male family members. Monogamy, the practice of having only one spouse at a time, was the predominant form of marriage among the Hittites. However, it is also known that certain high-ranking individuals such as kings might have had multiple wives. Because why not? The practice of exchanging goods, also known as bride price, and the giving of gifts from the bride's family to the groom's family, aka the dowry, were common customs among the marriage, which is still kind of practiced today. Women played significant roles in religious ceremonies and rituals, and they could serve as priestess, and some inscriptions suggest that they had the ability to communicate with deities through divination. Divorce was possible in the Hittite society, and for both men and women, they had a right to initiate the proceedings on both ends. The reason for divorce could also include infertility, neglect, or incompatibility. The birth of children was high highly valued in the society and sons were especially desired as they would inherit property and continue the family lineage whereas daughters were also more important as they could be used to form alliances through marriage. Like many ancient societies, today's society adhered to traditional gender roles and women had fewer rights and opportunities compared to men as they were primarily responsible for domestic tasks and had limited participation in public and political life. Number 9. Hierarchy and Social Inequality Like many ancient societies, the Hittites had a hierarchical social structure. The king and Nobility had held significant power, while commoners and slaves had fewer rights and privileges. As always, in this hierarchy, they had the king, who held the highest authority in the state, and royal family members, including the queen and the king's children, also held significant status. Below the royal family was the nobility and the elites, and this class consisted of high-ranking officials, military leaders, and members of the aristocracy. They held positions of power and influence in the government, military, and religious institutions. Free citizens comprised a significant portion of the population. They included land-owning individuals who were not part of the nobility, and they had certain rights and responsibilities within the society. The commoners were individuals who did not own any significant amount of land or hold any positions of noble, of noble authority. They made up of a majority of the populations and they were engaged in various occupations including farming. Craftsmanship and trade was also part of these jobs and in contrast, commoners and slaves had a limited sources of economic opportunities and land ownership was a crucial determinant of social and economic status. The nobility and elites owned large estates while commoners just had small land. Slaves and servants did not have any ownerships and the ability to seek legal redress or protection varied depending on social status. Higher ranking individuals, especially members of the nobility, likely had greater access to legal resources and representation. Number 8. Ritualistic Practices Some of the religious rituals of this society, while also culturally significant to them, may be considered disturbing or unusual by modern standards. These practices include offerings, divination, and other ceremonies. Divination was also a practice used to seek guidance or insights from the gods. This could also involve methods like examining the entrails of sacrificing animals, interpreting omens, or using other forms of divination tools. Animal sacrifices were a common form of rituals in the Hittite religious practice. Animals such as sheep, goats, cattle, and sometimes even humans were offered to the gods as a way to seek their own favor to appease them. Number 7. Capital Punishment While these specifics are not well documented, it is likely that in case of very serious crimes, the death penalty could have been applied. Some offenses may have been punished with physical means such as flogging or other forms of corporal punishment. Offenders might be banished from their community or sent to a distant location as a form of punishment. And of course, capital punishment was typically reserved for the most serious of crimes, such as killing, treason, or other grave offenses that were considered to be particularly heinous or detrimental to the community. The specific methods for use of capital punishment in this society are not extensive documented. However, it is likely the methods are such as hanging, stoning, or even severe forms of execution that may have been employed. The decisions to impose capital punishments would have likely been made by council of elders, local authorities, or a higher ranking official. The accused individual would likely have been subjected to a legal proceeding with evidence and witnesses presented. In some cases, the remains of executed individuals might be treated differently from those from dying of natural causes. They might not have received the same burial rights or be buried in the same locations for the criminals. Number 6. Exile Exile was often used as a form of punishment for individuals who had committed serious offenses, instead of more severe penalties like corporal punishment or execution, individuals might just get kicked out of their community or sent to a distant location. Exile could also impose for various of reasons including criminal acts, political dissent, and other behavior seemed harmful or disruptive to the community. The decision to exile an individual will likely have been made by, again, a council of elders, local authorities, or high-ranking officials, and the specifics of the process would have been determined by the nature of the offense and the applicable legal codes. Exiles was actually typically sent to a location far from the original community, and the destination could vary 
and might be determined by factors such as the severity of the offense and the resources available to the community. The condition faced by exiles would have depended on the various factors, including sources provided by the community and the local environment of the destination. Some exiles might actually be allowed to return after, after a specific time, while others might face, you know, permanent banishment. Like, they never liked you anyway, so get out. In some cases, individuals who have been exiled might have seek re reintegration into the society that after serving their sentence. In some cases, individuals who have been exiled might seek to reintegrate into the society after serving their sentence, and this process would likely involve demonstrating remorse, seeking forgiveness, all that jazz. Exile has not only affected the individual being punished, but also the social implication of that society and community. It could also serve as a deterrent to others, especially if there were disagreements about fairness and necessity of the punishment. Number five, chariot warfare. Chariot warfare was a dominant form of battle in the Near East, and the Hittites were known for the proficiency of chariot warfare. This form of combat was inherently violent, and Hittites, char and Hittites chariots were typically lightweight, two-wheeled vehicles drawn by two horses. They were designed for speed and man maneuverability, and making them the effective for a hit-and-run tactic on the battlefield. Jeez. Each chariot was typically maned by a two-person crew. Uh, the charioteer was responsible for driving and controlling the chariot, while the other one, which was another soldier, was armed with weapons such as a spear, bow, or javelin. Hittite chariots were, excel were very excellent at hit-and-run tactics, and they would approach enemy formations, unleash volleys of arrows or javelins, and then quickly retreat to safety. This tactic was highly effective in disrupting enemy lines as military technology and tactics evolved. The significance of the chariot warfare actually began to wane, and they eventually adapted to new forms of warfare, including infantry-based tactics and siege warfares. Number four, treatments of prisoners of war. The treatment of prisoners of war in ancient times could be harsh. While the Hittites had legal codes that governed the treatments of captives, depending on the circumstance, prisoners might face, you know, enslavement, forced labor, or even execution. They might be assigned tasks such as agriculture work or construction or other forms of manual labor. In some cases, prisoners of war who were assimilated into Hittite society might have an opportunity to integrate and adopt aspects of Hittite culture, and this could include adopting the language and the customs. Some prisoners of war, particularly soldiers and warriors with valuable skills, might even be given the option to join their military instead and serve as missionaries. It was not actually uncommon for captives to be held for ransom, especially if they were high societal status or had significant value to their people. Ransoming prisoners of war was actually a way for them to gain economic or political advantages. Number three, warfare and conquest. The military would also be used for a variety of weapons, including swords, spears, bows, and arrows, and other implements of war. And they were actually used in direct combat during military campaigns. Like many ancient societies, the Titanides were engaged in raiding and plundering of enemy territories, and this involved acts of violence against both military and civilians. They would also sometimes conclude punitive expedi uh, expeditions against regions or people that had rebelled or defied their authority, and the expeditions would also involve acts of violence as a means of punishment, like any complex society. They were likely experience internal conflicts and power struggles. The conflicts could result in violent confrontations among factions within society. Number two, like this prisoner of war, slavery. Like many ancient civilizations, the Hittites practiced slavery. Slaves were considered property and did not have the same rights and freedoms as individuals. They're often used for labor and other tasks, as well as in certain cases, particularly the serious offenses or a result of war, individuals might be enslaved as a form of punishment. Slaves and servants occupied the lowest ring of society and they were considered property and did not have the same rights as free individuals. They could be owned by the state nobility or private individuals. Slaves in Hittite society also comes from various sources and they might have been captured in warfare, born into slavery, or have enslaved parents or something around the line. Slavery played an important role in the economy of the empire and the labor of the slaves, including agriculture, construction, and craftsmanship. The treatment and the conditions that the slaves would widely depend on the master. While some slaves might have experienced harsher treatments and very difficult conditions, others might have actually been pretty chill with it. And finally, number one, human sacrifice. There is evidence that that suggests that they actually, like other ancient cultures, practice human sacrifice in certain religious contexts. This involved offering human lives to appease deities or other rituals. These ceremonies may have been conducted for reasons such as appeasing deities, seeking divine favors, or marking significant events. The practice of human sacrifice, if it existed, may have varied over time and across different regions within the empire. It's possible that the frequency and circumstance of such, sac such sacrifices changed over the course of the Hittites history. Some scholars argued that references to sacrifice texts may not have necessarily referred to human sacrifice sacrifice, but could have maybe offered humans instead, I mean, uh, offered animals instead. Evidence of human sacrifice is found in other contemporary ancient cultures in the Near East, so it's possible that they may have participated in the practice, but other specifics would likely have been influenced by other cultural religious beliefs. Some burial sites with unusual characteristics have led to speculations about possible sacrifice 
practices. However, interpretation of such sites are subjected to ongoing research and debate. The riddle I gave you guys in the last video goes like this. The more you see me, the less you can see, and I visit you every day. When am I? The answer is darkness. Well, that's all, and for your next riddle, what is something that you can have but you can't touch? You can change whenever you want and you use every day, but you can't if you've never seen me. So, what am I? Be sure to put your answer in the comments below, and I'll reveal the answer in the next video. Top 10 disturbing facts about the Titanic you never knew. That's all for today. Thank you for joining me. My name is Jessa, and be sure to like and subscribe and do something good for yourself today. Alright, bye. <laughs>